Now, one of the challenges we face is that from where we stand today, no one really knows what the economic future is going to look like in the next three to five years. Uh, most of us have a strategy. It's called hope. You know, we have a set of assumptions and we're just praying to God or, or whoever our spiritual leader is that that will play out. Let's just have a quick show of hands. How many people in this room have a business strategy to do less business this year than they did last year? I don't see a single one. Right, so the challenge is, given that we have economic uncertainty, how will you succeed under different possible economic circumstances? So what we ask people to do is to think about a range of different economic scenarios to rehearse the future and for each one to think about how you would do business. The first one is one where we get over some of the short-term difficulties and then the US, Europe and Japan you know, carry on growing at 2 to 3%, India and China grow at 8 to 10%. Between them, they bring the developing world with them. The second scenario is one where we see Europe, the US and Japan slow down, China and India continue, and you'll start to see real tensions emerge. And some say that's the situation we have now with the developing world increasingly aligning itself with China and India and saying, please be our spokespersons uh, or our spokesnations uh, at world discussions and debates. The third scenario is one where basically Europe, the US and Japan stall, China and India slow down, and some developing economies start to struggle. The fourth one is where China, uh, the Europe, Europe, the US and Japan go into recession, China and India do slow down. They haven't completely decoupled. And we think under this scenario, certain developing economies would fail. We estimate that there are about 30 countries in the world now that are just economically inviable in their current status. They would almost be forced to merge. So what we're saying is don't pick the one you like best. Don't pick the one that looks like you can make most money under it. Think about how you would do business and how would you achieve your goals under any one of those scenarios. Now, one of the big challenges with the kind of growth we're talking about is the impact on energy. If we look at the growth forecasts, the estimates are that world energy demand is going to grow by at least 50% by 2030. In this region alone, we're talking about nearly a 3% growth year on year in energy demand. But what we know is if we can improve on that, every 1% we can reduce energy demand, we can save over 60 billion in planned energy infrastructure investment. But one of the most interesting solutions coming out to this is coming from the most unexpected of places. It's coming from Abu Dhabi. A city called Mazda, uh, being developed by Abu Dhabi, will be the first energy neutral, waste neutral, and carbon neutral city anywhere in the world. It will open in 2015. They broke ground in February of this year. And, and the reason they're doing this is that they want to build that city so that they can build the processes and the solutions that then that create an industry that can be taken anywhere in the world. We also know we face massive challenges on infrastructure globally, both in terms of repairing existing infrastructure. In the US, the estimate is now that every year for the next five, the US would have to spend over $1.5 trillion just to repair problems in its current infrastructure. And then if we look globally at the challenge to build new infrastructure in developing nations, the OECD estimate that we would have to spend 25 to 3.5% of GDP globally for the next 50 years to deliver the infrastructure we need. Now, I'm not going to talk about the problems of climate change and the environment. Many other people are going to deal with that. I'm really excited about some of the solutions coming out. People in the industry giving themselves permission to believe that they can change our, our course. Uh, to, now, it's fine to lobby. It's fine to have the campaigns to justify why we're not as bad as other industries. My problem is I've never seen a good argument or a good piece of lobbying stop a glacier from melting or stop a hurricane from ravaging people's lives. So we've seen two really good examples in the airline industry alone. One is Virgin, who are going to talk to you later, but who have committed to greening their airline over the next 10 years and committed 10 years of profits to doing that. But the other end is a tiny airline that's just started up, a business-only airline flying London to New York and London to Dubai called Silverjet. And what they said look, was, look, the cost of dealing with our carbon emissions is just as much a cost that we have to bear from day one as the cost of buying our fuel or paying our staff. So they built in from day one an offset charge into every ticket price. And this is an airline that's continuously borrowing money in order to keep itself afloat. But they believe that it's not possible to be an airline that isn't dealing with its costs. Uh, one of the most innovative solutions we've seen in terms of resources is actually Lisbon Airport. And we face a fantastic challenge on resources on the planet. 
if we want to carry on consuming just at current rates, we would need two planets worth of resources. If the developing world actually wanted to consume at the same rate as Europe, we would need three planets. If the developing world wanted the silver medal in the consumption Olympics and wanted to consume at the same rate as the US, we would need five Olympics. And to get gold medal standard to consume at the same rate as California, we would need eight planets. So we know we need some really innovative solutions around resources and the use of resources. And Lisbon came up for one, with one. For the 2004 European Soccer Championships, they didn't want to build a new terminal just for one month of soccer and then have the problem of filling it for the next 25 years. So they took over an old military hangar. They shipped a temporary airport in. They ran that airport for a month. And at the end of that month, they put it back in its box and sent it away. That airport then reappeared in 2006 in Doha in Qatar, where for one month, three million people went through it in a tent in the desert uh, for the Asian Games. For me, that's a very innovative, innovative approach to the use of resources, and I think there are many more available to us. Now, one of the challenges for us is that at the same time as we're facing all these tough environmental challenges and all these other issues on the planet, we're also at a really exciting time in the industry's development where we've seen more imagination being unleashed than at any time in the industry's history. Some really fascinating ideas. I'm not going to judge them, but I just think there's some really interesting things happening, which if we're going to deliver on them, we have to get it right environmentally. I mean, just share a few. Moscow now is building a city called Crystal, uh, a structure called Crystal Island, a tourism and leisure destination will be the world's biggest man-made structure and biggest enclosed space, a $4 billion development. Uh, San Alfonso, what you see here is the world's biggest swimming pool. That tiny thing in the middle is the resort. The thing that wraps around it is the swimming pool. Uh, Beijing, we've seen this hotel, Zhedao Natural Resort. This guy started as a farmer, decided that organic might be quite an interesting way to go, then discovered that people were quite interested in visiting his farm. So he now has a thousand-bed hotel where people are coming to see sustainable agriculture in practice and to see a truly sustainable resort. He's now being pushed by the Chinese government to roll this proposition out across China. Uh, we've seen Macau. Macau's now got the accolade of making more money out of the convention industry than Las Vegas. Uh, we look in India, a fascinating development is one called Ginger Hotels from an offshoot of the Taj Group, where they were set the challenge of saying, look, with all these business travelers in India, they can't afford to pay $400 a night. Can you create a hotel where you can provide really high quality facilities, but at $26 a night? They failed. Uh, they only managed it at $26.40, and it's now about $30. But they're rolling this chain out across India. Very high quality finish, but a very low price. The challenge is the, the environmental challenge and the resource challenge. But really, the prize in terms of innovation at the moment goes to the Middle East. Uh, our research on the future of travel and tourism there identifies about $3.6 trillion of investment going into travel, tourism, and the supporting infrastructure. Uh, as we say, over 900 hotels, 900 plus aircrafts, a phenomenal investment going on, and absolutely unbelievable designs. This is Hydropolis. This is a hotel that will open 30 meters below the sea. Uh, if you're staying in the Centara Grand and your window leaks on the third floor, an engineer will come and fix it. If you're staying on level minus three of Hydropolis, uh, if you see a drop of water on the window, that's pretty much cancelled Christmas. <laughs> uh, think about the engineering skills, the innovation you need to deliver something like that. Uh, many of you will see in these Palm Islands, the world, these developments going on in Dubai. We have to remind ourselves that Dubai is a city of 150,000 people with a population of 1.5 million in total. Just those developments you see being built off the coast will add three and a half million people to Dubai's population. Uh, uh, the biggest economic development going on anywhere in the world at the moment is King Abdullah Economic City, a huge travel, tourism, and innovation city being built, and Saudi has six more of these uh, under development. Possibly the most imaginative and scary, innovative, whatever you want to call it, development is Dubailand. Dubailand is a development on the edge of Dubai that's bigger than Dubai itself, it's bigger than Singapore, and it's a theme park being built. Uh, those lights you can see in the background are a 10-kilometer strip of hotels costing $60 billion uh, to deliver 54 hotels into that strip. So what do we know? We know there's a phenomenal range of innovation going on. The challenge is how do you make sense of all that and what does it mean for us? 
So the work we've been doing with, in the Middle East is to say, well, how do you make sense of the global trends, the industry trends, and the development plans, and what does that mean for you? And to really lay that out as a timeline. Because when you do that, you can start to see where the issues come out. Where will you face water shortages? Where might you have climate issues? Where might you have resource issues? Where might you face overcapacity? And what I'd ask you to do is to do the same for your destinations, to understand what the implications are of the plans going on and the developments happening. So that's been a fairly rapid run through of some of the global challenges, reminding ourselves of the kind of scale of the opportunity, the size of the prize. And I just want to finish with four thoughts for you. If we're going to succeed tackling the climate challenge, but more importantly, ensuring an overall sustainable industry, I think we're now faced with four challenges. One is to make sure that we think about those different scenarios and we look at the global economy and say, how will we achieve our goals under different economic circumstances? The second is we do have to face up to our environmental footprint and to make sure that we really aren't taking more from the planet than our fair share and that we're protecting it for seven generations ahead. The third is around talent. In the Middle East alone, we estimate they're going to need two and a half million extra staff for all those developments. Uh, we would argue that in the industry now, we need to be investing in, in primary schools, in nursery schools, all around the world to provide those feeder staff, and in the remedial education programs for adults to bring them into the industry to resource all these developments we're doing. And the final one is around resources. If energy prices are going to hit $200 a, a barrel, if food prices are going to go up, if construction material prices are going to go up, then actually it becomes core to our business plan to make sure that we're developing a low resource model. It becomes central to the operating model for every one of our industries. There's an author called Graham Greene, and my favorite quote from him is that there comes a time in everyone's life when you have to open the door and let the future in. I think the reason that you've all been very brave to come to this open challenge on climate change is that door is very firmly open for you. I hope in the last 20 minutes I've just given you a few thoughts on what you might find on the other side and some innovative ways in which we might tackle the challenges. Thank you.